good morning to you all good on, morning on behalf of department of english of sir sita ram and lady shanta bai patkar college of arts and science and vp varde college of commerce and economics i welcome you all to this rusa sponsored international webinar on revisiting students in this modern world where activity is stressed almost to the point of pain quietness as a childhood need yet a child's need for quietness is the same today as it has been <clears throat> it may even be greater for quietness is an essential part of all awareness in quiet times and sleepy times children can dwell in thoughts of their own and explore a beautiful world through the books they read there the children may not understand all that is happening below the surface of a story or be able to find or verbalize it. but they sense there is something more than that meets the eye on an almost subliminal level they are aware of the texture a richness of texture of meaning and emotion a richness that is inexhaustible in a good book and then they will come back to it again and again perhaps long after they have stopped being a child today children's literature has been largely institutionalized on an international scale through publishing houses theaters libraries storytellers critics periodicals instructions in academic institutions conferences and awards it is now more expansive and diverse than at any other time throughout history changes in technology <coughs> modern amenities and luxury have brought a greater level of entertainment we now have children's literature that encompasses many genres in and of itself from historical fiction to fantasy to science fiction to graphic novels it has also developed immensely in the topic selection what once existed um, for moral development um, now exists to explore a number of subjects ranging from environmental preservation ecological innovation to sexual orientation and that is the reason we selected the theme revisiting children's literature we are extremely happy to have with us our three resource person for today dr kumi vivaina dr mark macleod and mrs tangita bansali all who have been actively involved and have contributed and we await eagerly to listen to them we are delighted to have an audience comprising educators from pre primary schools across the country and abroad principals and administrators librarians research scholars psychologists and counselors in development like archive associates parents and of course teachers i'm sure all of us will have a wonderful time revisiting the may i now call upon our principal dr shrikant sab to say a few words on this occasion dr shrikant sab uh so you need to unmute yourself hello yes sir hello. yes thank you dipti hello everyone good morning and a very warm welcome to you all on the occasion of hosting this rusa sponsored international webinar on revisiting children's literature organized by department of english of chikitsak samaj sir sitaram and lady shantabai patkar college of arts and science and vp varde college of commerce and economics Parker Vidya College is one of the <coughs> premier education institutions in Mumbai's western suburbs. Since the establishment in 1964, it has constantly worked at increasing the number of courses it offers students and bettering it, its infrastructure. The college has gone steadily over the last five decades and keeping with spirit of learning and growing. We have set high standards. working continuously towards advanced goals today education from ug to research commitment to vision and mission easy accessibility and highly dedicated and motivated staff have made the college a name to reckon with 
The college is recently reactivated in its third cycle with A plus grade and securing 3.53 CGPA. College is granted autonomous status. Uh, college is certified, ISO certified 9001 and 2015 and DBT star scheme awardee. We are recipient of best college award by University of Mumbai for the year 2016-17 and Indian Education Excellence Award 2018 Berkshire Media LLC USA. Education World India, we are ranked 45th at all India level and 10th in Maharashtra among us the non-government autonomous colleges. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome our eminent speakers, Dr. Kumi Vivena, an education futurist, internationally acclaimed educationist, Dr. Mark McLeod, McLeod, an international scholar for children literature, and Mrs. Sangeeta Bansali, founder Kahani Tree, an exclusive bookstore for children. I also extend my warm welcome to Honorable Sri Kishoji Rangnekar, sir, President Chikisak Samoha, Sri Rajesh Desai, Vice President, Dr. Gurunath Pandit, Joint Secretary, Sri Girish Amonkar, Joint Treasurer, and all the office bearers of Chikisak Samoha. Dr. Mala Kharkar, CEO, and the Department of English, the, or the Organizing Committee, Dipti, Gautami, Essasri, and Mushtaq. Chilean literature includes stories, books, magazines, and poems that are made for children. We have a wide variety of books for children. Reading these books helps them to make inquisitive, develop their taste of reading, broadens their views, horizon, and also creativity. This webinar is a contribution to revisit children's literature, an attempt to discuss on children's literature that remains always neglected part. Let us push children to reign happily in their golden arms of innocent bliss. I'm quite sure that our immune speaker will give us insight and see, uh, insight to see our children literature from different perspective, from different angles. Once again, I would like to welcome all the delegates, participants, and resource person for this webinar. Thank you very, thank you very much. Over to Dipti now. Thank you, sir. Uh, our parent body, Chikitsak Samoha, has a long history of 114 years working in the field of education. Managing body of this institution is headed by a very dynamic personality, our uh, president, Sri Kishore Rangnekar. I'm very happy that he is today here to bless us. May I now request Rangnekar, sir, to say a few words. Over to you, <clears throat> Rangnekar, sir. Namaskar and good morning to all. At the outset, I congratulate the English department. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. At the outset, I congratulate the English department of Patkarwarde College, Mumbai, who has organized the webinar on revisiting children's literature. I also congratulate Mrs. Muzumda and her colleagues to let the registered participants have views of experts and knowledgeable persons like Dr. Kumi from States, USA, Dr. Mark from Australia, and Mrs. Sangeeta from India, who is the founder of Kahani Tree, on this webinar. I am grateful to all these experts having accepted our invitation. I recollect my childhood and the literature we had some 60 to 70 years ago. And when I compare it with the literature my grandchildren read and study, I notice the lot of change that has taken place. But the basic motive of the children's literature is not changed. I would like to quote two lines of our great Marathi saint, Samartha Ramdas Swami. I quote, Mulancha chaline chalave, Mulancha manogate bolave, 
तैसे जनास शिकवावे हळू हळू इट मीन्स वॉक विथ द स्पीड ऑफ द चाइल्ड स्पीक वॉट द चाइल्ड अंडरस्टँड अँड टीच देम स्लोली वॉट वॉज रिटन फोर हंड्रेड इयर्स एगो इज टू टुडे ऑल्सो द वर्ल्ड लिटरेचर अँड द मॉडर्न लिटरेचर मे नॉट बी द सेम बट इट टेक्स केअर ऑफ द स्पीड ऑफ द चाइल्ड अँड ऑल्सो the understandings of the child good literature plays an important part in our life whatever the children learn in their childhood has great impact on their life it gives you information <clears throat> knowledge and also entertainment without taking much time i once again express my gratitude to these experts who have agreed to be with us through this webinar i look forward for a wonderful discussion on various topics on children literature close to our heart thanks thank you thanks once again thank you very much sir i'm sure all of us are going to have a wonderful time listening to the experts i also welcome our vice principals who are here uh, dr arti savan Dr. Ramesh Yamgar, who is also the nodal officer for HUSA and uh, the IQAC coordinator, and Mr. Nivruti Kumbhar, welcome all of you. May I now call upon my colleague, Dr. Gautami Ambie, who is also the organizing secretary for this webinar, to introduce the keynote speaker for today, Dr. Kumi Vimal. Over to you, Gautami. Thank you, Deepthi. Good morning. I welcome all participants, and I now request all participants to mute their mics and switch off their video. It will improve the quality of the stream. Um, I have been given the really lovely task of introducing Dr. Vivaina, but uh, she really needs no introduction. because those who have been lucky enough to study or work with her have benefited from her warm and empathetic nature and the intellectual rigor and discipline that she brings to her subject i have also benefited from them both as pg and phd students but ma'am support continues every time our department attempts to face a new challenge we seek her guidance and participation and she has never once refused to help us this just goes to show how warm hearted she is but actually speaking she has every reason to stand on ceremony her credentials as an academic are truly formidable she retired as professor and head of the department of english university of mumbai in 2016 she has two phd degrees to her credit one in literature and the other in education she is a critic and writer of international repute with numerous publications awards and national and international honors and fellowships to her credit but she is not only an academician she is also a renowned storyteller and a writer of stories for children believing firmly in the healing powers of responsible storytelling uh, for instance in 2008 following the mumbai terror attacks she led school children to create stories poems and art on non violence in the face of violence as a selection of these uh, was published in a book titled i have a dream uh, that had a foreword by mr ratan tata and it was released by martin luther king the third in uh, 2009 along with the core committee of wordfully yours in 2011 Uh, Dr. Vivaina organized the hugely successful seminar festival and workshop titled Magic of the Word, which involved students, parents, college and school teachers. Uh, High-profile artists like Mr. Nasiruddin Shah, Mr. Amol Gupte and Mr. Astad Debu performed alongside school students who wrote their own scripts and also enacted them. In the field of education, Dr. Vivaina is deeply involved in innovative learner-centric curriculum designing. teaching pedagogy and evaluation techniques in 2013 her book on education 
resourceful intelligence, understanding uniqueness and oneness through education, was selected as among the 18 best books published in the USA. Her most recent book, What Children Really Want, has been hailed internationally as a path-breaking innovation. Also, she has twice been invited to deliver talks on the TEDx platform, once with the title Overhauling Education by 2027, and the next time uh, with Life Skills Through Literature. All this shows that she is truly an apt choice as one of the speakers today. Ma'am, we are so very happy that you have accepted our invitation and I now request you to take over. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gautami. Thank you, Professor Dipti Mustak, the management and principal of Patka College. I'm delighted to be here and to talk on a subject that is very, very dear to me, very close to my heart. Can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, okay. So children's literature. I think it's an extremely important but neglected topic, a neglected area of research in India. Children's literature, I feel, should be a regular subject at at least the postgraduate level. When we had Professor Mark McLeod from uh, Australia, who's going to be a speaker today, we had such an enthusiastic response from our postgraduate students. Several enrolled, we had to actually shut down the registrations. So there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of potential. We can, as literary critics, we can approach children's literature from diverse angles. And I think uh, it's wonderful that you have chosen this as a theme of your seminar today. So without much ado, I think I'll start sh sharing my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Right. So I have entitled my presentation today, Change the Story, Change the World. These are the words of the science fiction writer, Terry Pratchett, and I think they're extremely relevant. In the first, that this presentation is divided into two parts. The first part, deals with evolutionary narratives for children, for changing the collective consciousness. And part two, evolutionary narratives for children, for changing the individual consciousness. So let's start with part one. Evolutionary narratives for changing the collective consciousness. It's really interesting that though we human beings keep saying we want facts and figures and we will base all our decisions on them, the truth is that we human beings live by narratives and not by facts. One of the renowned mythologists, Joseph Campbell, very rightly said, our myths are our reality. Our myths inform us, they guide us, they tell us how to live our lives, and they are a very vital part of our subconscious. In his most recent book, Yuval Noah Harari, in 21 Lessons for the 20th Century, talks, however, about the crisis in narratives. There were four major narratives in the 20th century. Imperialism, communism, fascism, and liberal democracy. Unfortunately, even liberal democracy seemed to have failed as we moved into the millennium. We were looking for a new story. And artificial intelligence and biotechnology seemed to provide us with that story. And we were on the verge of what could be called biotechnological democracy. We felt that with the help of technology and biotechnology, we will be able to realize the 17 sustainable developmental goals designed by the United Nations, which the United Nations says all countries should achieve by 2030. We felt that we would have more le leisure time. We would be able to do things which interest us while the more mechanical jobs would be done by the machines and the bots and robots. However, there were also people who warned us 
of a possible post-truth dystopia, enriched by writers like Huxley, Orwell, Bradbury, and most importantly, I think, Margaret Atwood in The Handmaid's Tale and her trilogy. They warned us that like everything else, technology also has a bright side or an ego side to it and a dark side or the shadow side to it. And that we should be really worried when dealing with it. With the coming together of artificial intelligence and biotechnology, we and we human beings alone will decide on the kind of world we wish to create. Interestingly, the pandemic has forced us into rethinking. For a while now, almost for centuries now, we normalized insanity and we were comfortable with it. Today, people talk about returning to the norm. God forbid that we should return to the norm. We seriously need to create a new norm. And this is a huge opportunity for us to decide whether we want to create a utopia or a dystopia. Way back, as way back as 1975, Jiddu Krishnamurti, one of the leading thinkers of India, talked about the need for a revolution in consciousness, which, as he says, involves a total apprehension of the process in which man's mind works, understanding ourselves as a total process. According to Krishnamurti, this is the only revolution that can bring about lasting peace. More recently, there are several others who agreed with him, but more recently, Yuval Noah Harari also says in his book that I just named, that a change in consciousness is more necessary now than ever before. For every dollar that we spend on developing technology, the next dollar should be spent on changing consciousness. But consciousness itself seems to be such a wooey, wooey, nebulous concept. Why do we need to change whatever this consciousness is? The truth is that we human beings lead our lives based on the level of consciousness we are at. The images and the sounds, whether positive, negative, or neutral, that form in our brain affect our body chemistry. That information is taken by the blood to the cells of the body and the cells of the body respond accordingly. It is almost a cliche now to say that literature and the arts help to change consciousness. We know that well enough. Way back, Oscar Wilde very pertinently observed, literature always anticipates life. It does not copy life, but it molds it to its purpose. All of us as literature students, we are familiar with deconstruction, with Derrida. We know how literature constructs our identity at both the individual and the collective level. So this is our chance. The pandemic has given us a second chance to really reconstruct our identity in socially just and sane ways. Now, could this be true of children's literature as well? Science tells us that our unconscious is almost entirely formed between the last trimester in the womb and age seven. After that, only 5% of our daily thoughts and actions are controlled by our conscious mind whereas 95% are controlled by the programs we have sponged up and which are now a part of our unconscious mind. Psychologist Rob Williams observes that by the age of 11, we are completely asleep on the wheel of our car. Isn't that dangerous? So it's extremely important that the children are given an opportunity to sponge up good, healthy, pro-life programs. Of course, I know the terms good and all are very relative, but healthy pro-life programs. 
So what do we need to engage with? We need to first engage with disparring, limiting devolutionary narratives rooted, if we talk about evolution, then we can talk about devolution. Ideas of separatism and violence are promoted in these kind of narratives. These narratives need to be critiqued as storytellers of our association, wordfully yours. Whenever we do storytelling, we pause and we ask the children for their take. We examine the narrative instead of innocently accepting it, as Umberto Eco would say. So when you critique it, you show an incredulity towards the meta narratives. Once again, literature students would know I'm quoting Leotard. It is important to have a critical mind even when we work with stories. We can rewrite the stories with a technique that I have devised as a storyteller called NRT, narrative recreation technique. In as short a presentation as this, we will not have the time to talk about it, but certain narratives definitely need to be re-examined. I'll give you a very, very quick example. I was once doing storytelling at the Children's Literature uh, Library in SNDT Women's University. And there was one little kid who was sitting right in front and he was dark complexion. The story that I'm um, Sorry, can you hear me? The story was Snow White. And my question after the storytelling session was what would have happened if Snow White was chocolate brown? And this little kid turns around and tells me she wouldn't have found her Prince Charming. Uh-oh, this needed to be discussed, I felt. So I said, well, maybe she would have a chocolate brown prince. She would have a white prince and would be mad about her color. Or maybe she didn't even need a prince. And this little kid looks at me as if, woman, have you lost it? And I said, there's nothing wrong with our color, is there? I love your complexion. It's beautiful. And I went on to other students. At the end of the storytelling program, when her mom came to pick her up, this little kid ran to her mom saying, mom, this auntie thinks I'm beautiful. There's tremendous power in narratives, tremendous power. So certain toxic narratives need to be rewritten. However, I don't believe that ancient fairy tales and folk tales should all be bundled and binned, no. We don't throw out the proverbial baby with the bathwater. It's a world of imagination, but let's critically examine them. And of course, some stories are so replete with separatism and violence that they just need to be outright rejected. I've been talking about evolutionary narrative. So what is evolution? Contrary to what Darwinians imagined, Evolution is not indicated by the increase in the number of genes. The genome project, project rubbished it, but higher levels of awareness and peaceful collaboration. This is not wish fulfillment. This is what science tells us that we human beings are hardwired, not for competition, but for collaboration. We do need a little bit of competitiveness, as much as perhaps salt in food, but not a whole dollop. It spoils everything. We need very little competitiveness because we are hardwired for peaceful collaboration. So as some thinkers like Mark Guffney say, we need to move from being homo sapiens to homo amor. We need to be love. I won't get into the details of this, but those of you who are interested would probably know that Einstein has spoken very, very eloquently about 
the homo amor. He hasn't called it the homo amor, but he has said love is the only thing that the world needs to understand. And unfortunately, the world does not seem ready for it. And he said that way back in 38, his daughter released those letters uh, 20 years after his death. But uh, we still do not feel that we've evolved from homo sapiens to the homo amor. So this is the next stage of evolution. So evolutionary narratives would do well to nurture what I call sourceful intelligence. Sourceful intelligence is this unique capacity that we human beings have of understanding and experiencing our uniqueness and our oneness. This is a rough diagram of the human mind as given by Jungians. The upper layers of the mind make us aware of our uniqueness. Of course, we are separate. Our bodies are separate. We believe we are separate. But at the deeper level, we are essentially one. And this is exactly what quantum science is talking about. Undoubtedly, it's something that the ancient people have been speaking about all along, the concept of oneness. So with narratives which are evolutionary in nature, we could transition our audience, our students, our children who are exposed to the kind of evolutionary narratives to move from self versus other to self and other to all is self. If we are locked in self versus other, we are competitive by nature. Everything is competition. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest one of all? Who cares who is the fairest one of all? Could we transition then to self and others? I have certain unique gifts. You have certain unique gifts and let's share them. So this brings in the idea of collaboration. But even at the second stage, the other still remains separate, the other. So we need to move to the final stage, which is all is self. All is self, I am no different from you. We are part of the same consciousness. As quantum physicist David Baum very rightly observed, at the superficial level, we are all separate. I'm separate from you, from the table, from the bottle, from everything else. That is the explicate order. But at the deeper level of consciousness, the implicate level, we are essentially one. If we can promote this kind of thinking among young people, we don't need to teach them value-based education. We don't need to have classes on EQ, SOQ, SQ, and now adversity quotient, AQ. It comes automatically. I'm definitely not advocating simplistic evolutionary narratives heavily laden with morals. For research tells us that text to life interactions are extremely complex. And who wants to be preached at? I am not in favor of that at all. We, we storytellers never talk about the moral. We just ask the children, what did it mean to you? What, which senses did it evoke, etc., and other questions, but definitely not morals. We don't use that word. Because our text to life interactions are very, very different. Each one responds to a creative piece of art or literature in a very, very different way. There's nothing predictable about it. So children too, as readers and as listeners, do not make mechanical transfers. As my friend first observed when I was working on a project with him, Mark McLeod, he, in, he introduced me to this very important concept that children engage with literature in their own unique and very complex ways. So this is something we need to bear in mind. With that, I move to part two of my presentation, evolutionary narratives for children for changing the individual consciousness. Evolutionary narratives ensure mental health and emotional balance. As we said in the first slide, 
Our myths are our reality. By the word myth, we do not mean a lie. Myths are spiritual clues to the way we lead our lives. So, healthy evolutionary narratives can ensure mental health and emotional balance. And even the most disturbing issues and situations can be dealt with from an evolutionary perspective, from the homo amor perspective. We could deal with trauma, with separation and death, with self-esteem, with academic failure, disabilities, depression, poverty, domestic violence, parental disharmony, same-sex parents, and a host of other topics. Very importantly, evolutionary narratives could also help develop character strengths as an antidote to what the father of positive psychology, Michael Seligman Paul, learned helplessness. We've only learned to be victims. We are not victims. So he and his colleagues, particularly Peterson, they came up with 24 character strengths and six classes of virtue. The six classes of virtue are courage, humanity, transcendence, temperance, trust, and most importantly, wisdom and knowledge. So all these character strengths could be nurtured with narratives. We now cannot complain that we are unaware of good stories for children because we have several websites. Sangeeta Bansali is going to talk about the Kahani Tree website and the rich treasure house that uh, Kahani Tree has. Uh, Young India Books by Shamim Padamsi is an extremely important resource and it deals with a lot of these char character strengths and virtues. So these are sites that we could look at. Though all these are equally important in our pandemic and post COVID world, the two most important character strengths, according to me, which will be necessary for the survival of the human race will be deep compassion through empathy. As you see, this is a, a, a photograph of the Dalai Lama and Daniel Goldman, who has written so eloquently on empathy. These days, every, almost every talk that the Dalai Lama uh, delivers talks about the need for deep compassion and compassionate leadership. These are the kind of leaders the world needs today. And some very, very interesting work done by Angela Duckworth on the importance of grit and resilience. She's a TEDx speaker and she's got a wonderful YouTube video among several other resources. And then there is Carol Dweck who talks about the importance of a growth mindset. Somehow these days one finds, I'm not critiquing parents, I too am a parent, but parents bring up their children putting a crown on their head saying, I am fragile. They don't allow their children to be strong. If somebody says a word to it, they roll up their sleeves and they reprimand that person in the presence of the child. They're just sending out absolutely wrong signals to the child. And children today do not have the grit and resilience which they will need in a post pandemic world. They will probably need to change their profession every 10 years entirely. Mm. For all this, they will need a growth mindset and grit and resilience. Undoubtedly, evolutionary narratives will also encourage the development of 21st century skills, like critical thinking. Every single narrative needs to be really what Coleridge said, dissect and dissipate in order to create. Analysis and synthesis, creative thinking, change orientation. I just spoke about change orientation. I also spoke about compassion and empathy, collaboration and communication excellence, but communication excellence with integrity. So I'm going to now give you an example of one of my favorite evolutionary narratives, 
written by the Canadian writer Robert Munch, and it's called The Paperback Princess. So here, this is how the story goes. Elizabeth was a not too beautiful princess. She was to marry a very handsome prince named Ronald. But one day, a dragon came and with his fiery breath, he burned up the entire castle and he took away Prince Ronald. Elizabeth was determined to rescue her boyfriend. She had nothing to wear, everything was burned. She found a paper bag under a stone and so she put on the paper bag and she went to the dragon's cave. She knocked at the door and she said, hey dragon. The dragon stuck out his nose and said, mm, a princess. I love eating princesses, but I'm a very busy dragon. I've eaten a whole castle today. Please come back tomorrow. And he banged the door so hard, Elizabeth almost got her nose caught in it. But she knocked again and she said, hey dragon, let's talk. So he opened the door again and he said, now, what is it? She said, is it true that you are the fiercest dragon in the whole world? And the dragon said, of course I am. And he took a deep breath and he blew out so much fire that he burns up 100 tons of garbage. Fantastic, fantastic, said Elizabeth, do it again. He was tired, but he did it again. And this time he burnt up 50 tons of garbage. But Elizabeth didn't stop. She said, one last time, dragon. But by now, the dragon was so tired, he didn't have enough fire to cook a meatball. Elizabeth then said, Dragon, is it true that you are the fastest dragon in the whole world? And he said, yes, of course I am, no doubt about that. And she said, prove it. So he ran around the whole world and he came back in 15 seconds. Fantastic, fantastic, said Elizabeth. Do it again. He was tired. He took very much longer. He came back after an hour. And Elizabeth said, well, do it again, one last time. After the third round, the poor dragon was so tired, he just lay down and went to sleep. Elizabeth tiptoed up to him. She knew the key was in his pouch, but she dare not as yet touch it. She lifted his ear and shouted, hey, dragon. The dragon didn't respond, he was so tired. So then she reached to the pouch and took out the key and she went and rescued Prince Ronald. Ronald looked at her and said, hey, you are a princess and you're dressed in a dirty old paper bag with muck all around you. I, oh, just get away from here. Come back to me when you are dressed like a real princess. Elizabeth said, Ronald, your hair is neat. Clothes are neat, but you're a bum. And they didn't get married happily ever after. For obvious reasons, you can guess why this is such an amazing story. It is the young girl who goes to rescue her prince in distress. She's not too beautiful, but she is really brainy. No swashbuckling, no killing. She just manages to rescue him, but he doesn't want to be rescued. He's a little foolish. This entire narrative does so much. And every time we tell the story, children come up with unique interpretations. Now I call this an evolutionary story because it does not teach separatism and it does not preach violence. And these are the kind of narratives and there are a host of narratives and both Professor McLeod and Sangeeta Bansali will be talking about specifics. But this happens to be my favorite story, favorite evolutionary story. So pro-life evolutionary narratives of this kind from a current treasure trove, as well as empowering narratives written by children and for children. I experimented with this by getting children to write when after the bomb blast, 
we went from school to school, my colleague Donna Reen and I, and we talked about the importance of nonviolence, even in the face of violence. And the children surprised us. Our entire team comprising Charlene Mascarenas, now Vevaina, and Nina Nair too, they felt that these were the most amazing narratives written by the children and we, they're worth publishing. Some wrote stories, some wrote poems, some did pictures, some made collages. So we got that published in a book by Orient Longman called I Have a Dream. And that made me realize how beautiful and fresh the thinking of children happened to be. There was one little kid from the first standard who said, I love this peace party. Yes, we need to have more peace parties rather than anything else in order to make a rapidly shrinking and increasingly threatened world a better place for ourselves and for the generations to come. So thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I think uh, for all of us, who, those who have had the opportunity and the fortune to attend your talks and attend your lectures will know the style and substance that you bring in. Almost always inspires everyone to, you know, kind of seek more education and pursue career almost in it. Uh, so thank you so much for bringing in such new concepts for all of us. I'm sure the participants have a lot of questions, which we will request them to reserve it until the last session. And then Gautami Ma'am will be taking ahead um, the question answers for all three of you. Thank you. Um, I feel I've been given the most toughest task to try and summarize your talk, but I'll try my best. Uh, your presentation started with um, a talking emphasizing the importance of um, uh, consciousness through evolution at a personal and collective level. And uh, you moved on to talking about the value of consciousness and or the, the value of nurturing empathy uh, in the 21st century where, where the whole world is at chaos. And you have this positive pedagogy approach which, which tries to look at every single thing as an opportunity to try and enlighten the world and create this globe as one big family and try and nurture the values of peace, love, humanity. You also moved on to talk about uh, the importance of literature and art and how the tools of literature and art will help us in the 21st century to try and uh, make sense of what's happening around us to try and challenge the grand dominant narratives and also to try and tweak in and insert our own personal narratives and find a voice out there. So that was impressive. What was also personally very motivating and very inspiring for me is how you brought in um, um, cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary references. So in a sense, it also kind of pushes us to, you know, go out there in the larger world to try and make sense of the chaos and bring back the treasure of knowledge. Okay, so thank you so much once again, and we'll meet you in the Q&A session. Um, we'll now move on to our next speaker, Dr. Mark McLeod. Um, I'll just give you a, a brief introduction about Dr. Mark McLeod, and then we will have him speaking. Uh, so Dr. Mark McLeod is adjunct senior lecturer at Charles Strath University in Wagga Wagga, Australia, and on the board of management at TAS Writers, the Writers' Centre in Hobart, Tasmania. He has taught children's literature, Australian literature, and creative writing at universities in Australia and around the world, most recently in India at Mumbai University and Sikkim University. President and Publishing Director of Independent Publishing House for Children and Teens, Dirt Lane Press, in partnership with publisher and editorial director, Marguerite Lemoyne. His publishing career focuses on narrative text as agents for change. He has been publishing director at Random House, publisher at Hashit Australia, and freelance editor for publishers, including University of Queensland Press, Omnibus Books, ABC Books and Queen, uh, Queer Inc. India. 
Mark is well known for his commentary on books for young readers on television, radio, and in print media. His, his current research interests are in LGBTIQ narrative for young people, the awareness and teaching of social justice and the adaptations of children's literature, uh, children's texts, I'm sorry. A former national president of the Children's Book Council of Australia, Mark has won awards for distinguished service to children's literature and for titles published under his own name imprint, Mark McLeod Books. For many years, he has been executive editor of the journal International Research in Children's Literature, published by Edinburgh University, and is the author of poems for adults and children and picture books for children. Um, I'll start his presentation. Over to you, Dr. Mark. Thank Mustaki. Namaste, friends. How I would like to begin by um, acknowledging the land which I'm speaking from. It's a very beautiful place in Australia uh, called Hobart. Um, it is the country of the Palawa and Mohaninia people, uh, First Nations people who are custodians of this land. And I would like to acknowledge the beauty of the mountains and the waterways and the living creatures. Um, that share this land with people like me. And I would also like to acknowledge the elders of the Palawa and Muhaninia people, uh, both past and present and emerging. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a great honor. I must be crazy to share this uh, seminar with Professor Kumi, um, who always knocks the ball out of the park but uh, that's the way it goes. And she's an inspiration and a great friend. Um, thank you so much, Professor Dipti, uh, Mushtakji, the whole team who've uh, worked so hard on making this um, a really memorable and important occasion. I thought that I would talk to you today about what lockdown has taught me about children's literature because we're just starting to emerge from these three months in Australia um, with quite a lot of difficulty. People said that going into lockdown was going to be difficult. I always thought that coming out of it was going to be more difficult because they've been, for example, um, they've been letting us back into coffee shops and cafes and so on. They've said, well, in a month, you're, you can start going back into the cinema. And I immediately thought, but do I want to? Uh, do I, am I going to trust the person next to me? And so on, you know, so it's, it's, it's a very interesting and difficult time. But three months ago before lockdown started, which I have to say seems like a lifetime ago to me, and no doubt with, uh, to you too, I sat one night with my two grandchildren who live in Hobart. I have two others who live in Sydney. Uh, while their parents needed a much, uh, had a much needed night off. And when it came time for bed, they asked if they could have a story. Um, and five-year-old Raffaella said that they loved to have their mum and dad sit um, between their two beds while they read a story to them. So I did that. Um, I sat on a little stool between their bed and we read a couple of books. And then seven-year-old August said, well, it's all right, granddad. Um, we've had enough stories now and uh, I really need to go to sleep. And he said, but to tell you the truth, granddad, um, after, after the first story, he said, um, you could go now, you could go out into the lounge room. Um, and I said, oh, are you going to be all right? He said, well, to be honest with you, I can't stand the sound of adults breathing. But when you go, could you leave the bedroom door open a little bit? I had to bite my tongue. Uh, but what I have to say is that I do have some advice for seven-year-old August, because when you're going to do or say something wrong, it's a really good idea that you should have paid off your younger brother or sister and any other witnesses. Because when they woke up in the morning and their mother asked how the evening with granddad had gone, Raphaela immediately mentioned that August had told granddad he couldn't stand the sound of adults breathing, purely because August wanted to finish listening to a story and he had a torch ready under the, under the bed covers for when granddad left the room. Well, their mother was exactly 
the, in exactly the same sort of bind that her older sister was when um, they were kids. 10 to nine in the morning, um, the kids should have been going to school. I'm waiting to drive them there. No sign of my older daughter, Finley. Where are you, Finley? We're going to be late, I yelled out. Then a distant voice came from the bedroom. Okay, Dad, I'm just writing a story. Yeah, sure thing. Um, was any, what was any parent going to say? So August obviously has inherited the family wisdom about how you can manipulate adults by telling them that you're really reading and writing. Although the bit that he missed, as I say, was the advice about making sure all your witnesses are also conspirators. When I was at school, the, the, the moment that I hated most was at the end of the day when I arrived back home each afternoon and threw my bag on the bed and tried to think of some new way to answer my mother's question every day. What did you do at school today? There are only so many ways that you can say nothing much. And I remember one time saying to mum, look, mum, I've already been through it all once today. Do I really have to go through it again? How unkind that was in retrospect, how I wish I could take back those words now. You know, my mother could have gone to university. She could have been a wonderful teacher. Well, she was a wonderful teacher, but without the formal qualifications. When she was 12, the Great Depression of the 1920s hit and her parents told her they could no longer afford to let her go to school. So she would have to go out and get a job, 12. And she found a job. The job was one day's journey away by train, by steam train. And it was as a governess to two small children on a sheep grazing property in central New South Wales. So, you know, I didn't understand until so many years later that the reason my mother asked that question at the end of every day was that it gave her such a lot of pleasure to think that what her parents had been unable to give her, she had been able to give her children. And that's why she asked. Um, you know, if I could go back, I'd bite my tongue off for having said to her, you know, such an impatient kind of answer. Do I have to go through it again? One of the effects of this lockdown over the last three months has been that parents don't need to ask their children what they did today because they know only too well. Um, homeschooling. I went round to visit my family, which are five minutes away, and I knocked on the door, you know, at this point, grandparents weren't really supposed to have any connection with their family at all. So we would go, I would make some food and I would take it around and put it on the front porch and knock on the door and run away <laughs> like a naughty child, really, when I think about it. Um, and I, I rang the doorbell this day and my daughter Halcyon opened the door and she didn't say anything. She just banged her head five times against the door frame. Um, and she just said two words, homeschooling. Um, after 20 years of hearing Australian parents say that they could do a better job than most teachers, now I hear constantly how much parents admire teachers for their professionalism, for their creativity, for their patience. Three months at home has changed so many things in Australia. In Australia, it meant no libraries, no bookshops for new books. So it was back to the old stories. As Professor Kumi said, you know, we go back and we, and we think back on what we've got in store. What was August reading and listening to under the doona? Enid Blyton. <laughs> I mean, you know, Enid Blyton is a great storyteller. Um, a horrible parent from everything we read, but a um, fabulous storyteller. <laughs> We'd really got hooked on the excitement of the new. And, and the new is important, of course. And the new, uh, you know, as Professor Kumi was saying, we know now that we can create new pathways, new neural pathways um, leading to new behavior by changing the story. So it is important to have new stories. But, you know, going back to the old stories, sometimes we can make them new because we are new. And the context in which we're reading those stories um, is new. Many years ago, I asked Australia's leading children's bookseller if she had a copy of Pat Hutchins's book, Don't Forget the Bacon. And she looked at me a bit puzzled and she said, oh, 
you still like that book? I was quite shocked, you know. Uh, <laughs> yes, of course, I still like the book. And that made me more determined than ever that she would think that uh, a real classic like that that I loved um, would have suddenly become tiresome to me. At the start of lockdown, therefore, I got out some of my old surefire books thinking, well, if the kids can't have some new books and if they can't go to the library, uh, maybe I can share some of my favourite old ones with them. And so I pulled out Flat Stanley. I pulled out How to Eat Fried Worms. I pulled out a book I had published, Bear and Chook. Pulled out Winnie the Pooh. Um, Patricia Wrightson's novel, I Own the Race Course. I pulled out Come Away from the Water, Shirley. The list is endless. So it's been a time of revisiting old stories, of remembering the pleasure and the value in a story that you can read again and again, and either discover details that you missed or look at it in a new way, as I say, because you and your situation are new. For myself, one response I've noticed is that, is that I look at all the pictures of people hugging and kissing in picture books in quite a different way now. And I could do without the fake air kissing that Australians have developed in recent years. But I wonder what I think about the predictions that I hear daily that handshaking in Western culture has now finished. It won't be coming back. I wonder if that's true. Um, certainly there were very negative things about handshaking because, for example, um, that was how you demonstrate a masculinity if you are a boy by the strength and firmness of your handshake. And the, the usual um, metaphor that I grew up with was people said, well, he shakes hands like, a, like it's a wet fish, uh, a limp fish. So these three months have been a period of looking back on old stories, of reevaluating them. Uh, do I want to rewrite history? No, I don't. Um, yes, it is true that there are many books that we probably think might be damaging to children now, might be irrelevant to children now. Uh, should we pretend they never happened? No, I don't think we should. Um, I get it. I get the desire to change the, the monuments, to pull down the statues that don't work for us anymore. But we can't pretend those things didn't happen. I actually think it would be much better to do what has been done in some other countries, and that is take down the old monuments and create a special park, like a museum, uh, with a wall around it if you want, um, and say to people, well, if you want to know what our culture used to value and used to think was really important, uh, then go to that park and have a look, just as you look in the museum. Uh, but as far as destroying them completely and pretending they never happened, it's not going to work anyway. So these three months have been a period of enforced slowing down and retrospection. The skies and the waterways have been clearer. The cities have been quieter. The spending has been more cautious. It's been a time, as I say, to evaluate gestures and friendships. It's been a time to reevaluate the home and work balance. It's been a time to reevaluate the need to travel. Desperately disappointed that I was planning to come to India for Professor Kumi's summit in October this year, and then it had to be delayed and put online in January. Uh, I'm disappointed because I won't get to see her in person and enjoy the laughter and the friendship of my many friends in India. On the other hand, uh, by positioning her summit conference online, she is going to reach many more people. So the two years of planning that she must have been devastated to hear she could no longer enjoy um, in a face-to-face -face situation, maybe it will be way better um, to be able to reach more people than ever. After the supermarket shelves in Australia were bizarrely emptied of toilet paper, what was the next product to disappear? Flour and then sugar, anything needed for home baking. It's been a time when people have rediscovered cooking. By the way, don't you think the American term cooking from scratch is quite weird? I mean, when I was a kid, that's what cooking was. And most of the people that I know in India um, would think of cooking, that's what you do. 
One of the major differences between the Great Depression of the 1930s and this lockdown, however, has been access to the internet. You know, there have been times in the last three months when I thought, wow, my life would be hell if I didn't have communication by the internet, if I didn't have movies to watch on TV, if I didn't have um, email and so on to answer. Uh, we've had information, we've had communication, we've had entertainment. In the 1990s, book publishers were frightened that new digital technology uh, would supersede the reading of traditional codex or hard copy books. By the 1990s, we had succeeded brilliantly in connecting the reading of real books with education, a movement, by the way, that started in New Zealand with the, the real books movement. But where we failed was in persuading children that books could be entertaining. So what we, what we ended up with was a kind of almost dialogue or competition between digital media, which were for fun, and books, which were for education, for learning. And booksellers have told me so many times how distressing it is when a parent brings a child into the bookshop and the bookseller shows the child some book they're very proud of and the child says, oh, we've done that at school. How deflating. <laughs> So a lot of money and creative energy in the 1990s went into trying to make books very fast by trying to make them dynamic, interactive, trying to make them as iconoclastic and entertaining as digital narratives, as movies, or later as computer games. Uh, publishers started to do what's called bolting on novelties onto book covers. So the book might come with a toy attached to it, or some jewelry, or some makeup. Um, the phrase used in the publishing industry was value added. So these books were value added if they had a, a, a bangle or um, a, a plastic toy bolted onto the book. Actually, for me, to have a plastic poo bolted onto the cover of a book was value subtracted. There were books on every possible bodily function. Why? Why? The poo and spew school of children's literature. Why did that happen? Why were there books about snot and poo and weeing and vomiting and farting and all the rest of it, you know? I think it was an attempt to rescue children's literature and children's books from the people who wanted to play ladies with books the people who wanted books to be well behaved. And, you know, when, 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 when I was a kid and we went into the library, it was like going into a hospital. You had to be silent. You had to be clean. Um, you, you know, you weren't supposed to really touch the books. Um, now there's a completely different relationship between the library and, and, and the book. Uh, there were books for both adults and children that were designed in the 1990s to chase the speed of movies or games. Well, you know, that project failed completely. A book is never going to be as fast or as breathtaking as the opening sequence of the James Bond movie Skyfall nor is it ever going to be as colourful and fun and crowded as pretty much any Bollywood dance routine you can name. So if books couldn't be that fast and if they couldn't be that colourful and crowded, then what could they be? What initially looked like disadvantages turned out to be advantages in books. What we liked about books, their slowness, the nuances of the language, the trustworthiness of the editing. Also their privacy. And this is something that Professor Kumi also um, dealt with. There's a kind of sleight of hand in the contract between a book and its reader. There may be many thousands of copies of a book in print, but individual readers continue to cherish the belief that a book has been written just for them. I've often marveled at the way that book readers will stand in line at some book launch for up to an hour, maybe even more, 
just to have the writer sign his or her name in the front page of a book. The closest analogy with the creators of film is to, I guess, the selfie, <laughs> where fans will wait for hours along the edge of the red carpet for the moment when they can yell out the name of some hapless passing star, lure them over to the ropes and click off a selfie that makes it appear that they've got some sort of personal relationship. But when they do that, that's more about the appropriation of celebrity status than it is about having or boasting about some personal relationship with the story. That's not really about this film is about me at all. It's really about, I want to be a celebrity and I know celebrity stars. Another indi interesting indicator of difference between books and digital media is the difference that with the convergence of media, the phenomenon of binge watching, where viewers of a TV series uh, watch a whole season or several consecutive seasons in one go, actually replicates the process of a 19th century novel reader. Some TV viewers may experience the total immersion that a book can offer when they actually binge watch a television uh, series. I personally resisted that whole phenomenon when it began, um, rather stupidly, I guess. I'd been told that I would just love the TV series Six Feet Under. People said to me, this is made for you, you'll love it. Until years after the show had finished, it went for five years, I think, five seasons. Um, and one day something took a long vacation, summer vacation, I had nothing to do. I was living in Wagga and so on. I thought, oh, I'll see if they're right. I could not stop watching. I watched all five seasons, which means I think about 61 hour episodes, something like that, all in one go, day and night for a week. Um, when that finished, when that week finished, I felt completely bereft. Um, I even remember saying out loud, I don't know what I'm going to do without these characters. So there's a very strange kind of um, analogy, I think, between the way that we binge watch television and the way that we like to immerse ourselves in a book. In Stories for Young Readers, I'd read Jay Asher's book, 13 Reasons Why. I had heard about 100 reasons why I would hate the TV series, but I did binge watch it. And I felt completely consumed and exhausted by the experience. The ending of the first season, this is a book, this is a book and a TV series, which I think um, is much on Indians' minds at the moment with the very tragic death of um, Sushant Singh Rajput. Um, it's about a girl taking her own life, uh, a teenage girl in the United States. And she leaves 13 tapes to tell her friends why she did it. And you go through each of the episodes, you go through one of the people, and this is why, uh, why I did this. This is very interesting to me because the looking back, the retrospection that I'm seeing in this is kind of, it's, it's of the moment when our society is looking back on old books, on old stories, we're looking back on old monuments, we're looking back on old habits and gestures, and we're trying to figure out why we are where we are. It's a moment of reflection. It is a pivotal moment. The ending of the first season, which uh, of 13 Reasons Why, which ends with Hannah's taking of her life is so confronting that I was angry when the producers of this TV series announced that there would be a second series and then there would be a third series and then there would be a fourth. Fortunately, um, the fourth is the last and I'm glad that they've announced that. But I watched them all and I saw the reasons for having the four seasons, though I mean by the time it gets to season four of 13 Reasons Why, it's really more about money than anything else. But there's just a absolutely devastating scene where a high school kid is made to go through a drill of what would happen 
um, if terrorists came to the school and started to shoot and attack the children. And he grabs a gun from one of the security guards and on learning that this was just a drill, it wasn't real, he screams at the principal, so do you think we feel safer now? It's an absolutely electrifying moment in the fourth season of 13 Reasons Why. And as a viewer, I realized that this was not made specially for me, but I realized that that character is speaking directly to my concerns about living in 2020 and some of the precautions that have been surrounding us and surrounding our children, even preschoolers and toddlers um, to make us feel safe. And I think, do you think we feel safer now? Um, so I am glad that that's the end of the series, but it was immersing in its own way. Even though technology has made it easier for an individual to watch any film or TV show by him or herself at a time that suits them, the individualization of the viewer therefore has never been implied in the creation of a movie or TV show. We know that films and TV shows and games are expensive to make and they're aimed at big audiences. But although the book as fashion accessory did have a moment in the 1990s, we've returned to the special relationship between a book and a single reader. Related to this issue is one that Dr. Kumi referred to, and that is the issue of privacy. Lockdown for most families has meant no privacy at all for children. Not only was your sister at home all day too, so were your parents, and then into the bedroom came your teacher and the librarian and the school counselor and all the kids in the class, both the few that you would invite home in better times and the ones you would never let through the front door. Whereas for most education policymakers, the classroom had once been for learning and home for entertainment. Now in lockdown, those distinctions were well and truly scrambled. Have a think about the term homework, by the way, and why that still causes pain. <laughs> um, it's an oxymoron in, in, terms, in the terms of the society that I grew up in, where home was for fun and school was for work. Bring homework home, whoa, no. So here in lockdown, the iPad and the laptop at home were suddenly for homeschooling. That change helped once again to reposition the reading of books. I watched as my seven-year-old grandson, August, went straight to my bookshelf and picked up the most recent of Dave Pilkey's Dogman series and ignoring the TV, went to the bedroom to read this in silence. Now, this is a kid who came to reading slowly, but he just can't put books down at the moment. Well, why Dogman? Is it just because it's popular and every other seven-year-old boy in Australia and around the world is reading it? Well, maybe. Although the competitiveness of having collected a series of books is mostly a private pleasure, ordering a metre of uh, richly bound books for display rather than reading is actually an adult perversion. It's not something that children do. A dog man is colourful and it's funny and it's episodic and it's colloquial. It's not as clever as the series that preceded it, The Epic Adventures of Captain Underpants, which has enough metafictional content in it to interest many of you. But Dogman does start with a premise that makes you want to see where the author goes with it. A police officer and a police dog are involved in a catastrophic explosion. The bad news is that the head of the bad news is that the head of the cop and the body of the dog cannot be saved. But medical science succeeds in suturing the two body halves together, therefore, therefore creating Dogman, a cop with the head of a dog, uh, which come to think of it has quite a contemporary relevance. Okay, so the premise of Dogman is engaging, but I think the appeal is that this series creates and empowers readers, reading, particularly for boys. Remember, what, 40 years ago, Neil Postman in the book, The Disappearance of Childhood, contrasted the ways that reading, book reading, required an apprenticeship, which we called literacy, which separated out those who could read from those who couldn't read. 
uh, Postman observed that no one had to learn how to watch TV, that it was just there in the lounge room available to everyone. You didn't have to be an A student in literature um, and language to read television. Well, that's the main achievement of series fiction, I think. And it's ironic that many adults disapprove of it. How can I get them to stop reading Dogman? How can I get them to stop reading Captain Underpants? Go back a generation. How can I get them to stop reading Goosebumps? How can I get them to stop reading Babysitter's Club? Well, my first thought when parents ask me that is put it on the syllabus, make it required reading. We teachers have been trying to do that for de decades and uh, have failed. So, you know, that'll do it. So hiding under the doona or shutting the world out with headphones to create privacy became more urgent than ever during lockdown. And without new books, I prowled along the shelves for old favourites or old promises to read that I hadn't got round to. And the old favourite that meant more than ever to me was Come Away From The Water, Shirley by John Birmingham. I love this book. Yep, 40 years later, after its first publication, I absolutely love it. I gave a spare copy recently to an artist friend in Hobart and she loved it too. She'd never seen it before. And she said to me immediately, I love that book. It reminded me that when my mother was a child, she used to hide in a cupboard to read books about pirates. In English language picture books, Come Away From The Water, Shirley, changed the ways that we thought about children and children's books. Shirley and her parents live in England and they go to the beach one of those awful English beaches that are all stones and a nightmare to walk across. The mother and the father in the book carry fold up chairs and newspapers and a thermos flask of tea onto the beach. On every double page, the mother and father are on the left hand page um, in pale washed out colours and they speak the only words that there are in the book and such boring mundane words they are. The father is buried in a newspaper He's wearing trousers and leather shoes and a brown sports coat onto the beach. Um, I don't know where this happens in India, maybe. Uh, in Australia, we always know who the British tourists are on the beach because they're the ones who wear thick woolen socks with their sandals. Well, the mother in Come Away From The Water, Shirley, has her knitting at the beach on the sand, well, on the rocks. <laughs> And she says, just kind of mindlessly, mind you don't get any of that filthy tar on your nice new shoes, Shirley. Don't stroke that dog, Shirley. You don't know where he's been. That's the third and last time I'm asking you whether you want a drink, Shirley. Ironically, every time the mother addresses her daughter, she calls her Shirley by name, but it's totally impersonal. She couldn't care less about Shirley. She's completely unaware of everything that Shirley's doing. And on the opposite page of every double page, Shirley's doing something really interesting. On the opposite page, there are no words at all. Shirley is standing on the beach and she sees a, a small rowboat and a dog just kind of materializes in the book. And the dog and Shirley get into this rowboat and they row out to the pirate galleon, which is flying the Jolly Roger. And they board the ship and they fight the pirates and they walk the plank and they find buried treasure. And eventually they return home just as it's time, they return to the beach, just as it's time for the parents to go home. So that boring composition title that we used to get constantly in Australian schools when I was a kid, write about a day at the beach has a completely different meaning for this child, Shirley, and for these adults. In the context of what it's often felt like house arrest over the last three months, stories that emphasize the freedom of the imagination, stories that emphasize and create alternate realities, and the way laughter can invite us to switch our perception and perceive differently have been really re-inscribed with meaning. Think about Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are. Think about the amazingly detailed alternate realities created by the Australian artist, Sean Tan. The main reason that we're drawn to Shirley is her silence. There was a whole conference last year on silences in children's literature. And some of the papers uh, from that conference uh, have been published in the new issue of International Re uh, Research in Children's Literature. 
I live at the foot of the mountain in Hobart called Kunangi or Mount Wellington. It's, um, it's, like, a, it's like a sphinx covered in trees. Uh, it's broods over the city. And the view from the top of Mount Wellington or Kunangi is quite spectacular. Look, I'm no great photographer, but I love this photograph of my Tasmanian grandchildren who I've been speaking of, August and Raffaella. Why do I love this photograph? Well, because I can't see their faces. They didn't know I was taking the picture. I have to imagine what they're thinking and how they're feeling. August is seven and Raphael is five. So what I do is read their body language. I think as I look at their feet, their little legs, I think that tells me some things. I won't articulate what I think it tells me, but you might want to think about what they, those feet tell you. Look at August's feet, look at Raffaella's feet. Of course, the shot is not at all posed, but it is kind of composed by me. So if, if I'm reading, I, I'm sort of saying to you that I'm reading their body language, but actually I'm asking you to read my language what I kind of imposed on this scene as I saw it and, and sort of decided to take a picture of it and keep that picture. None of that's certain. Even if I did ask the children what was going through their minds, would they know? And could they find the words to tell me? A graphic novel that I like very much is Cece Bell's book, El Defo, which was published in 2014. The artist, um, Cece Bell, um, it's very much a memoir about her own life. The protagonist in it, named Cece, contracts meningitis as a child, and both she and her parents are shocked to discover that when she recovers, she's lost much of her hearing. Why has the graphic novel become such a significant platform for storytelling? Well, go back a couple of generations and children read comics surreptitiously because adults thought they were garbage and they would corrupt young minds. By the way, by the way, that's been the initial standard judgment of most popular narrative forms. The reading of novels and fantasy was a ticket to insanity for many commentators in the 19th century and before. When television arrived in the mid 20th century, my own parents thought it would fry our eyes and our brains. Uh, and they might've been right. Um, and we weren't allowed to have television for six years after it arrived in Australia. And then <laughs> my mother's former um, fiance, who struck up a friendship with her and my father late in life, um, arrived with a TV to give the family. I reckon my mother could have just, <laughs> I don't know, done something really terrible. Um, she must have been furious that she had preserved us from television for six years. And here comes her old fiance um, with a TV to give her for the children. Yeah. After many generations of predictions that the graphic novel would be the next big thing in children's literature, although that predominance didn't really materialize, actually now the graphic novel is the site of some very innovative storytelling. Artists have learned from picture books and from film and from gaming that the real power of imagery in the graphic novel comes from exploring the silence and the spaces between the words, what isn't said. And both illustrators and designers are using the physical properties of the graphic novel to the page itself, the structure of the page to create meaning. The first thing I notice about El Defo is that Cece is pictured as a hybrid she has the body of a girl, but the head of a rabbit. This would be a startling metaphor for her difference as a hearing impaired child, except that everybody else in the book is half rabbit too. Uh, that's very clever because it means that she's no longer unique. She no longer stands out. Everybody in the class is. Now, look at the way that uh, the artist uses space, blankness, uses the potential of type. Um, Cece forgets to recharge her battery in her hearing aid. And so you can see the ink fading out there. Um, I'm the sorry screen. to interrupt, Dr. Mark. Uh, yep. I'm afraid that we have a, 
uh, we, we might exceed the time. So if you could just uh, please finish your uh, presentation in 10 minutes. Yep. I, we I might exceed will. the time. No, Thank that's you. what I'm planning to do. Um, the, this this uh, use of the rabbits also can relate the, uh, the book to things like Mouse, um, Art Spiegelman's um, groundbreaking graphic novel. Uh, it also makes you think of, um, I'm going to see if I can move that. Okay. Well, Mushtaq, can, can we move on to the next couple of slides? I still need the slides, sorry. I will, I will move fast. Um, so there are, there are precedents in there that are, that are connected. Um, Australians are, the interesting thing about this character is that she is not entirely lovable. Um, she's difficult, she kicks her parents. Um, she privately thinks sarcastic thoughts about her classmates. She voices their limitations. Um, we are beginning to see what's been called dismissively in the United States, sick lit and even crip lit uh, about disadvantaged characters, um, but disadvantaged characters who are not wholly easy to love. They're complex, just as any real human protagonist ought to be. Well, Australians are like most colonials early adopters. And it's fascinating to think back on the late 20th century when academics embraced so fully a new orthodoxy in the postmodernist project with its focus on the formal properties of a narrative and the constant deferral of meaning. But what we're seeing in children's literature now is a determined search for the truth. Um, Mushtaq, if you can just uh, maybe flick through a couple of slides for me. Yeah. So here we've got the famous remark, infamous remark by Donald Trump about what you're seeing and what you're reading is not what's really happening. Um, how are we as parents and teachers and, and carers for young people and, and how are books going to help them? Well, the first thing to say is you need lots of information if you're going to make a decision about where the truth is. You need to check inside. You need to look at context of both the book and what has been said before. And the final book I want to talk about with you or refer to is one, and it's no accident that during this period, we've got, um, oh, I really want to talk about poo. Can I just take one minute? I'm sorry. Poo in Tamil uh, means flowers, but it also means poo. Um, this is a fabulous book. It's so confronting. It's about a child who says that her family tradition is picking flowers. And she says, I hate picking flowers. I hate the smell of them. I hate the feel of them. I hate the petals falling on my skin. Um, as we progress through it, she says she has no friends in the class. Can we look at the next slide? She says she has no friends in the class. Well, she says, I don't know why. Um, one thing that's not spoken in the book and that is silent is that she has darker skin than everybody else. And so we're starting to see a, a silent exploration of race differences and, and the source of prejudice. And that brings me to my final book, When Stars Are Scattered. This is an absolutely fantastic book um, published this year. Uh, I want you to think about Roxanne Gay's comment in the New York Times recently. The rest of the world yearns to get back to normal. For black people, normal is the very thing from which we yearn to be free. When Stars Are Scattered is the story of two refugees from Somalia who have been brought to live in a camp in Kenya. The first thing you notice is for a graphic novel, it's full of words. And you look at that page there and you think there are too many words. Graphic novels are supposed to be about very few words, but lots of pictures. What happens in this is that the writer, who is the, one of the refugees, um, and his collaborator, have paid children the compliment of laying out the difficulties of a refugee. These children um, have been ripped away from their mother. She lives in Somalia. They don't know if they'll ever see her again. They don't even know if she's alive. One of the children is very smart. One of the children has an, an intellectual difference. And 
the smart kid, who's the narrator, Omar, has been offered the chance to go to school in the refugee camp. But going to school means he would have to leave his um, disadvantaged brother alone all day. And he feels completely torn about this. He feels torn because it's his job to educate himself. That's what his mother would want. But he feels torn because um, this would abandon his brother. Um, so what is happening here is a dialogue in very interesting pictures, but in lots of words, um, going through the complexities and trying to get at the truth. So for me, um, can we have a look at the next slide? And this will be the last one. When stars are scattered. Like many narratives that are now based on actual experiences, this finishes with um, a, some, a, an, an autobiographical note and some photographs. The two boys did go to the United States. They did have a successful life there. Um, they did go back and visit their mother. Um, and so it's brought around um, to a really satisfying conclusion, a story that's very confronting, like many narratives about real life experiences. In her polemic uses of literature, Rita Felsky argues that we go to literature for four motives. We go for recognition, we go for enchantment, we go for knowledge, and we go for shock. And what I see in contemporary children's literature now is a commitment to inform so that young readers can find their own way towards the truth. With so much suffering, it seems reckless to hope that good will eventually come out of this terrible lockdown period. But it has sent us back to familiar stories. It sent us back to the past. It sent us back to reposition books in relationship to other narrative platforms. It's confirmed the values of privacy, individualization, the slowness of the reading process, and its commitment to knowledge and to the search for truth. Like the children that I've known and loved all my life, I believe so strongly in acknowledging the reality of the stories that have brought us to this point and the need to create new stories for the future, that to me, it hardly seems like a choice anymore. It's simply what I have to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Thank you, Dr. Mark, for that impressive lecture. And I really, I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That was a very impressive lecture. And I really loved uh, your ideas on silence and how spaces between the words really help in conveying the meaning and they really intensify the experience of reading. And also the importance of revisiting the past. We really need to learn from our past while we keep an eye on the future while being firmly rooted in the present. I'm sure our participants are encouraged to revisit all stories and children's literature with a renewed sense of uh, interest and curiosity. So thank you very much for that wonderful lecture. And now it's time uh, to invite our next guest, Mrs. Sangeeta Bansali, founder of Kahani Tree. So a little bit about Kahani Tree. Kahani Tree is a children's bookstore established in 2006. It is located in Prabhatevi, Mumbai. It offers a wide range of multicultural books in English, Hindi, and other regional languages. Uh, Kahani Tree also supports um, a lot of independent uh, Indian publishers, over 25 Indian publishers and over 20 international publishers. And on weekends, Kahani Tree has a tradition of hosting book readings and storytelling sessions to really encourage a passion and love for reading amongst children. And I believe it is a space like Kahani Tree that offers young minds the liberty and the freedom to explore whatever um, insights their curiosity and their sense of wonder. So let us take a look at this magical world that is Kahani Tree with the following video montage.
Now let us hear the inspiring story of the woman who turned her love for books into a successful enterprise. Presenting Mrs. Sangeeta Bansali in conversation with Dr. Mark. It's a delight to have you both with us. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is really great for me, Sangeeta. Um, yeah. India has some wonderful bookshops and Mumbai has uh, two really special bookshops, uh, Kitab Khanna and the Kahani Tree, um, which I love. Uh, tell me about how, what you were wanting to do when you set up Kahani Tree. So uh, Kahani Tree came from my need to diversify my children's bookshelf. So I mean, diversify is now a book, you know, is, is, a, is the buzz today. But back when my kids were growing up, uh, they're both, they're 28 and 25 now. And so this was way back in the late 90s. Uh, I realized that they had a lot of fantastic international books, Western books on their shelves, the Enid Blyton's, the Roald Dahl's, and later the Harry Potter's. But when I looked at their shelf, I found such a lack of good contemporary Indian literature. We had mythology and we had the Panchatantras. Uh, we had the Amar Chitra Kathas and the Tinkles, but we didn't have any contemporary children's literature. So um, I went out looking for it and I found that it was not available in our children's uh, bookstores because the bookstores had more of the Western, Western books and other books that weren't really representing the stuff done by the independent, uh, small independent booksellers, uh, publishers. Uh, I kind of understood the problem that these small independent publishers had to get their books to the store because I was a small, uh, I ran my uh, publishing business myself and I was a small independent publisher. So um, when I met with Tulika, Radhika Menon of Tulika, and she showed me this wonderful range of children's literature that they had been doing for about 10 years then. And I felt badly that our city had not had access to this collection. So we brought these books to Bombay and um, we, I started uh, doing school book fairs. I took them to my school, my children's school to start with and other schools in Bombay. So it started from the need to bring books, contemporary Indian books to Bombay. And unfortunately they weren't represented or given shelf space in the stores. Yeah, I can. I, I, the first time I went into a crossword uh, book chain um, and I said, could you show me the most recent Indian picture books? And uh, the, the sales attendant said to me, uh, that's easy, there aren't any. And I said, <laughs> I said that can't be true. Um, and he said, well, there aren't any. Um, and then he showed me exactly what you relate. Um, some of the classics, you know, the Mahabharata and um, Panchatantra and so on. Um, done in a fairly tacky style, in, in a sort of mock Hollywood animated style. And I thought there has to be better than this. And thank goodness for Kahani Tree because um, it changed my, <laughs> changed my view entirely. All the books were there. Uh, there were people selling books who didn't know. So who are your customers? Who, who do you think they are? Uh, so my customers are mostly parents and children uh, who come to the store looking for an Indian book collection. Now that Kani Tree, for, for the longest while, for almost about 10 years, I was just the wall in the Vakil's office. And we had just an Indian book collection. Now we have a slightly bigger store space. And we have a more diverse and a, a collection which also encompasses some Western books as well. So mostly children and parents, but I'm very happy to say that we also now have teachers and librarians coming to the store uh, because they also find the need to add diverse books to their book collections in schools. Uh, we have lots of nonprofit community organizations that come to build little reading corners in their uh, or in their little spaces and they want books in languages so since Kani Tree supports publishers who uh, publish in various many languages uh, we are very happy to give books in regional languages to these organizations uh -huh. recently we've been very happy because we found counselors and therapists coming to the store 
And uh, yes, and they were looking for books and I was wondering why and what they were doing with books. And uh, we were looking at picture books together and I was telling them all my favorite stories. And I realized that they are using children's books in their sessions with uh, not only children, but also with adults. So that has been, uh, uh, it has been so lovely to meet all these various people because what has happened as a result of all these wonderful people coming into the store is that we've learned how they use books and we can in turn share these stories with others. What sort, what sort of questions do people ask you, you know? Uh, yeah, when, when they come into the shop, what sorts of things do they want to mm-hmm. see? And what, what do they ask you? Is there a particular book about some topic or yeah, what sorts of things do they want to know? Well, mostly book recommendations. And yes, a lot of them ask us, what should my five-year-old read or what should my three-year-old read? And then we kind of book, we kind of talk to them and say that it's not, the age is not so important as much as understanding what your child's interests are and that your three-year-old or five-year-old may be different from my three-year-old or five-year-old. So there's a lot of conversation that happens there. And uh, we try and understand what they want. We understand what they've liked reading and what they've enjoyed reading and then uh, recommend books according to, uh, to, that, uh, to their interests, you know, try and, and match and, them. And do, and do Indian parents let their children choose the books? Well, we're seeing more of that now. I think we are seeing a lot more of that happening now because I think uh, schools are talking to them and saying how choice matters and how it's important it is for children to be allowed to select their own books. Of course, they need to be guided and nurtured and shown different books than what they would pick up. But yes, I think it's important to give them choice. And I often tell parents who come to the store and say that, um, you know, I don't know, my child doesn't like reading. So that I think is an indication saying we haven't quite found the right book for your child. So let's find out what your child is interested in and try and find something that matches your interests. But I think as a parent and as a bookseller, I think we have to work that much harder to find a book that interests your child. Uh, but that's a, that's a great part of the challenge, isn't it? You know, I... It used to annoy me. I was a part-time bookseller on weekends for some years and I would get annoyed when a child would pick a book up and say, I want this book. And sometimes a mother would say, no, you don't want that book. What does that mean? You know, No, you don't want that book. Like the child's just said, I want that book. <laughs> I, I love Robert Cormier saying, you can't make a child read a book that she's not ready to read. You can't make a child. We've been trying. Teachers and educators have been trying through exams and set texts and so on. If the child isn't ready to read the book, and that just doesn't mean language ready, it means emotional readiness and all sorts of others. So so what sort of feedback do parents give you? Do they, you know, do they tell you when they don't like a book or do they uh, tell you if something's difficult? Well, most times they're so gobsmacked to see our collection so you know that's the thing that you know we uh, I have to say we've been a little clever about the fact that because we are a small uh, store space we don't keep in our store space books that uh, that are widely available in retail so wow. in a sense I've kind of curated the collection to work uh, for parents, you know, so I, as a parent, I've been a little clever about it. I think that so some of the books, and I'm not saying that books should be banned or not read, but we've kind of curated the collection uh, uh, quite tightly so that what is available in our store to make space for books that are not easily available or visible in the retail space. So they've been very happy with the collection. They come back to us. So, uh, You had taught me, you had told us, Mark, because when I met you, I think we had just about started Kahani Tree. Mm. And one of the things that you shared with us was about shelf talkers. Mm. And you had told us the importance of shelf talkers. So now in the store, we love putting up little recommendations. Of course, Mm. the team, my Kahani Tree team, uh, we put up recommendations. We put up recommendations by teachers and by parents. And we also love putting up recommendations by children. And then we encourage our, um, our uh, customers to walk around the store and find what suits them. 
we also try to segregate things so that they can find things by themselves, but we're always around to book talk and hand sell books and recommend books when they need. It's a, it's a bit of a tightrope act, isn't it? Because on the one hand, parents want advice. They do want hand selling and teachers and librarians do. But on the other hand, people want to feel they have that individual freedom to choose a book, you know? It's sort of like you're, you're trying to balance those all the time, I think. That's right, that's right. And I think more than hand selling, it is just getting to know the customers better yeah. to understand what they want. And also, I think when we talk books and we are genuinely, uh, we, we actually talk books about the ones that we really love. I think they want authentic recommendations. You know, I think that is what we are looking to do is that we're not just trying to sell them books, but we're also trying to help them to raise readers. I think that's the kind of trust that we have built up over a period of time is that, you know, it's not just selling a book. We, we, we've loved this book and that's why we are sharing it with you. And that's why we are showing you this book. So I think over a period of time, we've built that trust with our customers and we are very happy when they come back to the store and, tell us how much they've liked something and they want something similar. Have, have, you ever, have you ever had to advise a customer that there's a difficult subject in a book or maybe some difficult relationships or language or something like that? Absolutely. We actually have a, a little category in our store which is called Celebrating Differences. So all our books that are slightly difficult, uh, I do put them on the side and we've categorized them. We have books on disabilities, breaking stereotypes, uh, bullying, and uh, all of these books are very special books and that they possibly need to be, um, you know, the parents need to be engaged, you know, aware of the books that they're buying. Uh, so they are categorized separately. And I, I find myself uh, hand selling these books a lot because I try to share with parents that unless we open the child's mind to possibilities and show them books. So uh, the other thing that I often love to share with parents is that they should continue to read aloud to their children as long as they are, as long as they can and long after their children start reading alone. Because I feel during that read aloud time, which is more bonding with their children, then some of these books with difficult topics can be brought out and shared with their children because you know, their children, they can have conversations about these books with their children. And that's so important because there will be a time where the uh, children will not let their parents into their lives. And their peers will become more important and their friends become more important. So at times like that, I feel if parents are engaged with their children and share bonds with their children, through books, they will be able to talk about these difficult topics about bullying and kindness and all of these things. One of, one of the things that the world reads about India these days is a very alarming, um, uh, well, race prejudice um, within the country and attacks on people because of their religious beliefs or whatever. Um, are there books that deal with those sorts of subjects? Are there books that are as difficult as that? Well, um, well not so much books for the younger children, but we do have young author, uh, young adult authors who have taken on these uh, topics. We have Paru Anand who has written a lot of books about um, about uh, this topic, and I think you might have uh, seen them. I would show you uh, some of this. You know, this is like smoke, no sun. Uh, you know, no guns at my uh, son's funeral. These are topics that have handled some of uh, these issues of caste. Stories of Difference, Paro Anand's book, which is the stories of differences. So I think these conversations are happening now in our country and we are very pleased to see it. At the picture book level also, uh, some of the small independent publishers have come up with uh, uh, books like Pooh, the one that you mentioned. Uh, we have Pooh on our bookshelves, uh, Mark, but unless it's not a book that will jump out at you or where the parents would pick up the book by themselves. But when I talk to them, or I talk to teachers and librarians uh, about a book like Pooh, they would definitely add it to their shelves. Another book that you said, which was about LGBTQ issues and gender issues, is a book called Goodly Has Wings. Mm -hmm. And again, the author has handled this, uh, uh, the uh, 
issue of gender identity in such a sensitive, gentle manner that, um, you know, but we have to book talk these books. It, th these books definitely have to be hand sold in our store. Has, ha, you know, I mean, um, I was thrilled that you have on your uh, recommendations, uh, yes. Julian is a, is a mermaid, yes. um, which is about a boy who likes to dress up in fancy clothes and so on. And then he's so lucky to find a grandma who um, sort of takes him under her wing and she takes him to the equivalent of sort of Mardi Gras. Um, yes. Obviously, LGBTIQ um, issues have been very much talked about in India as with the rest of the world. Um, but have you had people complain about that being in the bookstore or included in your selections? Um, has that no, been a difficult think, topic? It is a difficult topic and it's just about coming out into the front, you know, so like Goodly is such a recent book. It's just come out about a, less than a, a few months ago. And um, we haven't had any um, uh, issues with it yet with the younger readers. We actually haven't even had feedback from the younger readers about what they think. But what we've had feedback from teachers and parents is that I'm glad that these books are around to be able to make these conversations easier. So, but no, I, I uh, at the store, I think we haven't had so much of an issue. I heard that some of the schools haven't been uh, in favor of having these books in, at schools because I think parents, uh, teachers themselves are not uh, quite sure how to handle these conversations. But I think India is still, uh, in that sense, uh, new to the whole game. I mean, we are, we are, we'll possibly handle this better with time to come. But there, but there is a big difference, isn't there, between putting a book on a syllabus and requiring children to read it and having a book in the library so that children can choose individually to that's read right. it. And I think, I think that's where parents who get upset about difficult subjects in books make the mistake of feeling it's being imposed on their children. Whereas I get that Kahani Tree is saying, we know some books that may be interesting to you if you want to choose them. You're not, right. I don't get that you're ever imposing anything on anyone. Yes. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I think that's the way we hope things will work. And, and, you know, I mean, you've obviously observed changes in um, publishing over the years. Are there, are there things you've noticed about Indian children's books changing? Oh, we've come such a long way from 2006 when we started, uh, you know, when I started Kahani Tree, I've seen such a, a, a fabulous change in, uh, in Indian publishing because uh, uh, we are now handling bolder subjects and yeah. subjects which would typically be taboo or be swept under the carpet. We have books on disability that is being talked about. And so, yes, uh, Indian children's publishers have come a very long way in uh, doing books like this. And I wish I could show you those books. Uh, you know, it, I, I wish I were in the store right now. I, I want to show one. Yeah, yes, I love, you, right. sold me, you sold me this book. I love this book. Yes, yes. Why, and, why is that, why is that, what do you think is the appeal of this book? I walk with Tambi. Well, it, this book has been, it, it's, it's about a child who is visually impaired and it's told in such a gentle, sensitive way where the story is, where, where the boy is allowed to be himself. The other thing is the disability is handled so well here because in India, you know, it, it uh, or not just India, but everywhere disability is uh, looked on as a lack of, uh, you know, it, it's considered that able people tend to feel pity for disabled people. But in this book, uh, the child is just allowed to be himself. Of course, there's a lovely surprise ending at oh. the time. <laughs> I, love, I love it because it starts off. The, yes. the things I, you know, I took Tambi for a walk today. Yes. And you assume you know who is who in the book. Yes. And the surprise is, you know, I won't spoil the surprise. Yes. But it is a terrific book. And um, then there is another book that I should show you, which of course has won all the awards this year, which has been Machar Joel, uh, which has been, this is this won the award this year. And Machar Joel is Fish Curry. Now this book has been written by Richa Jha and been illustrated by Sumanta Day. And if you can see the illustrations in this book are beautiful. almost you know, cinematic in their whole approach. Beautiful, yeah. Now, 
uh, this book is also such a lovely story about a little boy who has the car you know he is visually impaired and he goes out to look for uh, to his father is ailing and he wants to do something for his father so it is a uh, lovely that he is considered as a caregiver here in this case and even though he is visually impaired and with a disability um, he is there he's allowed to i mean he's not allowed he has the courage to go out into the streets of calcutta and he picks up fish from the store uh, and takes it to his grandmother's house uh, this is, these are the pictures this is of the fish thing and he goes to his grandmother's house they make fish curry and he brings it back to his father and kind of reassures him that you'll be well if you have this fish curry now this book was such a surprise to me because until i reached the end of the book i didn't even realize that he was blind because the illustrations were done so beautifully without making an obvious statement about his impairment so when i reached the last page i said gosh this child was blind it is only on the last page that i kind of figured that he was blind and i had to go back to the first page again to read the story again my heart i was holding my heart and then i came back to the first page and i to read the whole story again so i'm very happy that they're making books like this which are very gentle in their approach and they don't uh make uh bring out the disability in a, in, in a very structured way yeah, I think, you know, um, I love that too, because the characters are made more complex. You know, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about white supremacy and, you know, otherness and so on. But I, for me, I want us all to be other. I want everybody to be individual and, and you know, the whole idea of, I, I, I'm afraid I don't like the phrase people of color because it actually inscribes the whole idea of I'm colored, you're, you're not, if you see what I mean. It goes back to the whole idea of colored versus white. Um, I would like us not to uh, talk about color at all, you know, and, and I'm not saying that cliche of, you know, I'm blind to color, I don't see it, that's nonsense. But what I'm saying is we're all individual and there is a book and a story for all of us, you know. Um, and that's what I really value in what you're doing at Kahani Tree. Look, we could talk for all day, and we usually do, um, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I don't want to exceed the time that they've given us. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. I've, I've loved hearing about these books. It makes me very, very frustrated that Qantas says they're not flying to anywhere until the middle of next year. Um, so we're just going to have to do some deals by mail, I think, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and I have to say you. that I wish I had, I was in your class, Dr. Mark and Dr. Uh, <laughs> to have studied children's literature with you because you, you know, the, your perspectives are so enlightening. And so thank you for that. One of the, one of the wonderful moments that I remember is um, when you welcomed the students and Dr. Kumi and I into the shop and showed us the shop and let us learn from what's going on in there. And I wish that more people would do that. Yes, um, we, so all power. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mark and Ms. Sangeeta. That was really lovely. And uh, before we start with the Q&A section, I would just like, um, to play another video about the initiatives that Kahani Tree undertakes. And, you know, now that people have heard Sangeeta speak of all these things, I'm sure they'll be able to absorb it even more. Uh, so, Dikti, would you please play the video? Thank you, Deepthi. 
that was really lovely and um, uh, we've been getting a lot of comments on the chat box and we have so many in fact that we have had to mute the participants unfortunately because it can get quite distracting to uh, the speakers we are aware of that but they have been nothing but complimentary and all the speakers have addressed so many of the questions we received about 300 questions and um, most of them, in fact, have been dealt with. Uh, we had sent uh, them to the speakers, and speakers have already dealt with quite a few of them. But we have also got a few more on the uh, chat box here and uh, on the YouTube stream. Uh, so uh, I would just like to add my two bits uh, after such a brilliant uh, session. I don't really want to leave a bad taste, but I just cannot help but share one memory. Uh, when uh, Dr. Mark and Sangeeta were talking about the role of parents uh, and how that helps to create readers, you know, my own love for reading came from my mother. She's always been my role model. And when she used to read, I would want to be just like her. So whether I knew what I was reading, whether I could read the script, but I wanted a book in my hand. And that is why parents are so important. And I was just wondering these days if parents are even aware of the kind of books that are being produced for children. And is that why children are reading less? I mean, we blame the gadgets and the technology, but are parents not themselves aware and therefore are they una unable or unwilling to do that kind of research and help their children become readers? W what do you think? Uh, I'll take that one because since I have <laughs> access to the parents and I need so I have to tell you just my, my experience of the lockdown time. Uh, ever since lockdown started, we've had parents calling us for books. So God, we, it has been, uh, it's been quite wonderful to see parents have been reaching us by email and WhatsApp, asking if the store was open because they wanted to spend time with their books, uh, with their children reading books. So yes, of course, access uh, to books has been difficult during this time with that but I think parents are reading they don't might not know about all the books out there because bookstores don't uh, necessarily present these diverse collections but uh, I think with online and social media and a lot of these publishers are online including as Dr. Kumi had mentioned Young India Reading and plus other websites like Reading Raccoons, which is a, a readers group based in Delhi that has almost 15,000 members. So I think there is a lot more awareness about the existence of these books now than there was before. I think, I think also um, uh, some people have observed that when we say children are not reading anymore, what do we mean? Um, sometimes educators and parents mean they're not reading literary fiction. It does not mean that they're not reading. When, when the internet became widely available to everybody in the 1990s, everybody said, oh, children aren't reading. Hey, as you look back on the internet now, don't you think it requires more reading than anything, any experience you've ever had in your life? I mean, some of it's rubbish. We know that. Um, some of it's just informational and disinformation, but they are reading. Our job is to help them to read more perceptively, um, to read better and to, and to be able to judge. You know, when Dr. Kumi and I were talking about truth and meaning and so on, it's our job to help children to sort through the rubbish, um, to find what is worth, worthwhile and what is truthful and what is valuable. So, I mean, with boys, for example, in Australia, uh, traditionally, when boys get to around the age of 10 or 11, they lose interest in what we would call literary fiction. But that doesn't mean they're not reading. They're reading like crazy. They're reading cereal boxes, newspapers, magazines, billboards, signs, and so on. So um, I think we need to maybe take a step back from this feeling of, oh, my gosh, you know, children aren't reading anymore and just ask ourselves, well, Maybe not what we were reading when we were younger, but they might be reading. 
Uh, if I may add, just, <laughs> just a very quick comment. I couldn't agree more with both the speakers, but they, I usually get requests, not only from parents, but also from schools, could you provide us with a list of age appropriate books? And I, I, I would say that uh, just have as many diverse books as possible, because what I deem as age appropriate is possibly not going to interest your, your readers. So if you take them to a bookshop and you really let them browse and feel the books and enjoy that, I think that's a, that's a wonderful experience. But usually I end up giving some kind of list to them, a thematic list. But when parents come to me saying that our kids are not reading, my first question is exactly what you said, Gautami, are you reading? If they yeah. see you reading, then they are likely to read. And as Mark also very correctly said, they're doing loads of reading. They're doing loads of reading, but they're, they're not necessarily reading literature. And it's completely unreasonable to tell them that I think Treasure Island is a great novel for kids, so you should be reading it. Well, if a Harry Potter or something else interests them, or even a silly Goosebumps interests them, just go ahead and read, is what yeah. I would say. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think also, I think also um, you know, when parents say to booksellers, um, I don't know what an eight-year-old child should be reading. Yeah. How about putting an eight-year-old child in front of a shelf of books and watch what they pick up? Yeah. They'll tell you, you know, because our research, we were, we were talking about this a little while ago, the research in publishing industry is that people spend between up, anything up to five or seven seconds before they choose a book or not. Um, a child only has to look at a page of a book to see whether she's interested. Yeah. And if she's not interested, you can do what you like to force that child to be interested. It's not going to work. And if I may just add one more thing, uh, it's very often that you may think this is appropriate for eight years old, but though the chronological age of the child is eight, the reading age of the child may be 12 or six yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but, but I, I want to put a little rider on that. Uh, one of Australia's best booksellers, a friend of mine, when she opened her shop, she said the biggest shelf in the shop is for children of an advanced reading age. Because parents <laughs> come in and say, well, she's eight, but she's really got a reading age of 15. Um, and so, so <laughs> you have to sort of be a little cautious with that. But yeah, I agree. At at, may I add, at Kahani Tree, I want to remove all the age, uh, uh, shelf talkers with eight. Uh, on yeah. them, which is three plus, five plus. So what I prefer is early reader, developing yeah. readers and confident readers. Yeah. And then yeah. I ask parents to figure out where they would lie. But that is my, you know, my entire categorization of the store is early developing and confident. Well, early, early in my publishing career, um, I put ages on the back of books because parents kept on saying they wanted it. And I put on a book of short stories, eight and over. And the booksellers rang up and said, would you please tell him to stop putting that on, book on, yes. on the book cover because we try to sell it to a 10-year-old and they say, but it says eight and over. And I said, but it says and over. And they said, <laughs> no, the parents don't read that. They just read the number. If it says eight, then it's eight-year-olds. Um, so it's very tricky, this whole business of ageing. But really, I think what we're all saying is trust the children. Trust the, trust the young readers. You know, it's very interesting, sir, that you say trust the children. But, you know, the kind of books that are being produced, um, it's adults who are producing them. So the choice of themes and subject matter and everything else, in fact, how the book looks, all of that is decided on by adults. Yes. So are yeah. children actually being given a choice or do they think they are choosing for themselves when actually the choice is being made by someone else? There are Gautami, many answers. Choice? I'm sorry. No, no, please. Gautami, isn't the choice always being made by someone else? We, we force a syllabus down your throat, even at the MA level. Yes. Because we think those, those are the books you should be reading. I wish we, we could ask you what you really want to do and create a syllabus based on that. But and I, I don't... Yes, but yes. Again, this is a choice I will be making for my students. 
Yeah, and I think it's interesting. Uh, Dr. Kumi is really developing some projects where children are more involved in, in the choices. But um, another answer to this problem is that pretty much every author for children that I know is actually a big kid. Um, that they're, you know, even authors in their 70s, 60s and 70s and older are really big kids in disguise, you know. So, I mean, they haven't forgotten what it's like to be a child. Uh, an Australian author, Lyleth Norman, said, if you want to be a children's author, you have to have the emotional memory of childhood. Yeah. If, you've, if you've forgotten how much it cost you to get on the bus or the train when you were a child, you can find that out. The internet will tell you. But if you've forgotten what it felt like to wet your pants in the classroom, it's very hard to get that back. Yeah. That's very true. That's absolutely true. Uh, so I think that uh, that automatically takes care of the question about, you know, how gender roles and how they are being normalized and uh, accepted. Uh, because if you say that choices are always being made by somebody else, then I'm sure that, you know, as adults, it is our responsibility to be more inclusive in our worldview. And uh, I, I really loved what you said, Dr. Marv, that, you know, every author for children is a child at heart. That's very important. Even as teachers, we need to remember that. Um, oh, absolutely we, true. We need to hang on to that, you know. We... <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Oh. Uh, uh, there is a question, uh, Dr. Marv, uh, for you. Uh, can fact and fiction be combined to deal with real life problems like neglect, bullying, you know, will it help uh, children to deal with such stuff? I think it's really a question for Dr. Kumi. Um, she because... has dealt with it, but one of our participants addressed it to you. I think I... Uh, it's more about uh, culture or something like that, maybe. I know, okay. Um, I, I have a book that I'm just loving at the moment. It's an Australian book. Um, and it's called Baby Business. And it is about the um, smoking ceremony, which is very much like uh, puja, um, where particular leaves and plants are chosen to burn and create a smoke. And then the, the smoke is seen as healing. And this book takes a baby, the women take the baby out into the bush and they light a fire with special healing plants. And they go through the parts of the baby's body and they, they drench them in smoke. And they say, this smoke is for your feet so that you will always be in contact with the land. This smoke is for your ears so that you will hear your dreaming. Your dreaming is the bee and you must always hear the bee. This smoke is for your tongue so that you will always use the pure words of your language and so on. So it's a blessing. And why is that useful? Well, first of all, for Indigenous uh, readers and Indigenous parents, this um, gives their, it empowers their culture. It says this is important. It's been put in a book. It's been put on bookshelves and in, in publishers' lists. For non-Indigenous readers, it also is empowering because it empowers us with information. You know, so the more information that we have, you know, right in the United States at the moment, part of the sickness and part of the problem the United States is experiencing is disinformation, lack of information, dismissive information. And what I think is really wonderful about books is they're still authoritative. There's still a lot of editing filters. There's a lot of care and love goes into what is happening. And this goes back to the slowness issue. It takes time to produce a book and to make sure that what's in it is reliable. And I think that is how we're going to change the future too, is people need to be better informed about what it's like to be transgender, uh, what it's like to be a girl you know, in a class of boys, what it's like to have a particular religious faith when other people don't share it. That's where children's books, and with humour, not, not to make it serious all the time, you know, humour, Dr. Kumi was talking about changing perception. Humour is a wonderful head turner. It makes you look at something from a completely different angle. I think uh, over and above what Mark has very, very beautifully said, I also think that they teach us to celebrate differences. 
And it's not just information, but it's something which I can also use. Today, we talk in terms of postmodern spirituality, where you pick and choose things which you feel you want to bring into your life. And these books open up very, very important aspects of cultures that we are barely familiar with. So I think it's it's just so wonderful to be alive at this time, to be a baby at this time, and not just hear your Cinderella or a Sleeping Beauty, but much, much more. Yes, and I don't really see the difference between fact and fiction. I don't see the boundary because it's all any which way is constructed. And fact is more, more fictitious sometimes. Fiction is more true than fact. So that kind of boundary, I don't see, even if you can set your plays in the forest of Arden or Illyria, as Shakespeare did. I'm sorry, I always have to bring in Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> he was talking about human emotions and uh, human ways of thinking and behaving. So even when we say fiction, fiction, well, the, the, the protagonists may come from Mars or they may come from anywhere, but uh, they're actually essentially human issues that you're dealing with, even in fiction. A book, a book, that, a book that you sold to me, Sangeeta, which is very yes. beautiful, yes. Um, which is Nanny's Walk to the Park. It's a really simple idea. Um, Nanny is taking the child through the village um, and you think that it's really about getting to the park, but it's actually about everything they see along the way. And, and each alley and each, each street is named, you know, the village of dreams or whatever it is, you know. And there are so many details in this. It's informative. And if anybody thought the village life was dull, uh, they would not think that after they read this book. Um, there are just so many things of interest. So I think what Dr. Kumi is saying that that fact and fiction are not separate like they were when we were growing up, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So that then that means that, you know, uh, there was a question on this also, but man has already answered it, that if fact and fiction are not so different anymore, then stories of heroes or legends or fairy tales, I think they are now being given in a form that is closer to life. Like what Dr. Mark said about that uh, baby business book where the different parts of the baby's body are being blessed. I, I, it reminded me of one of the fairy tales. I think it is uh, Snow White uh, where all the uh, witches or the fairies come and bless, mm. uh, you know, they bestow different blessings on the, uh, the newborn. Isn't mm. it similar? I mean, it reminded me of that. Well, I, think, well, I think it's now being given in a more relatable form. No, no, Mark, go ahead. No, I was going to say one of the things we're finding out in First Nations cultures around the world is that they have information which we've been ignoring. Um, they have information about health, about healing, about the land. I mean, one of the things I love in Australia is here where the British came to this country and tried to impose four seasons on Australia. Many Indigenous speakers have said, hey, listen, mate, we've got 12 seasons in this country. And in New South Wales, where I was living uh, for most of, most of my life, there's a very short season. And I listened to one of the women elders say, the worst season is called whatever the name was. And it's only six weeks long. And she said, the wind blows and we have to turn our huts against the wind so that it doesn't come. And she said, people get asthma and, and coughing. And we just say to the men, for God's sake, go away for six weeks and come back when it's finished because they drive us crazy. Um, now that's sort of, that's almost fictional, but it's based in fact, and it's based in a lived experience. And, and I mean, Sangeeta's shop is full of myths and stories based in wisdom that we have not paid attention to. And I think basically the image of the hero has expanded I'm thinking of Joseph Campbell, the hero with a thousand faces. Yes. Now we literally have heroes with a thousand faces, starting with your superheroes, who are very, very exciting. And then uh, we have all these other wonderful heroes uh, sh rubbing shoulders with them. So yeah. we literally have heroes with thousand faces. True. True. I think we just have time for one question more, and I'll... I'll try to take a question which links up with this. 
uh, uh, where we said that, you know, um, Dr. Mark also said it, that there is uh, more information being given. And Dr. Vivaina said that uh, uh, there is no fact or fiction anymore. There's no clear cut boundary anymore. Uh, but uh, this is about the theme. What about the techniques of storytelling? I mean, are those a little too sophisticated? Because sometimes, you know, uh, maybe a technique like story within the story is being used. And is that a little too sophisticated for readers of a certain age? Uh, I, I don't know, maybe Sangeeta ma'am would be able to answer that. I mean, do parents or children pick up such books? No, I, I sorry, I didn't get that, uh, the, you know, so much because... Technique of storytelling, madam, is it sometimes no, so too story... simple or is it too sophisticated? No, we uh, have it... not had that issue at the store. I think the books that are being published now are quite... Uh, in the sense they, they we don't have that issue. I think Dr. Kumi about storytelling, I think the technique of writing story uh, at, at the children's bookstore space, and I have a lot of books for primary school children in the store. We really haven't had that problem. So is that a problem for children at older uh, older readers? Is that possibly? I don't think it has been a problem. Do, at do, do children come back and tell you, I did not understand the story? Never. Have, has there been a problem ever? They no, understand ever. it in their own unique way. Yes. Initially, yes. if you are doing a, po a story poem, there is a slight apprehension. And then they enjoy the rhythm and all so much that they forget those apprehensions. I mean, people have grown up with some crazy fear of poetry, which is absolutely my favorite form, though I will also say that drama is. <laughs> but poetry is just so beautiful. So initially you start out with a Dr. Seuss and you narrate the poem. They, they say, oh, but, but this is different. And then they get used to the rhythm, to the rhythm, they love it. So I, I don't know because maybe as man said, you know, they understand it in their own way. Uh, I request the participants to please mute themselves. Participants, please mute themselves. Marie, sir, please mute yourself. Uh, um, Ma'am, what you were saying about people understanding things their own way, children especially, like in Harry Potter, in the third book, there is this whole uh, time sequence where they go back in time and... Uh, my husband still has problems with that. He's also a big Harry Potter fan. But when my 10-year-old or 12, I think she was 12, when she read it, my niece, she had absolutely no problems. He still debates the mechanics of that scene. And she never has a problem with it. So maybe, yes, they don't have I, an issue with it. I think, I think also that um, fiction has become much more colloquial. Um, there's been a convergence of the storytelling language so that when um, people wrote for children in the past, um, they had all sorts of rules like don't use contractions in English, say I do not rather than I don't. Well, writers in Australia have realised that that was a surefire way to kill the book off in the child's interest. If the, if the people, if the children and the parents in the book don't talk the way that children and parents do, then the child will just perceive it's some alternate reality that's got nothing to do with them. So children and parents talk more like people outside books do these days. And I think that has meant that storytelling has changed. But I mean, you know, here's another book that Sangeeta, um, I'm blessed to have been given, and that is, um, What Did You See? I love this. And the structure of it is a surprise, you know? So here's a, here's a, here's a grandma who's just, thrilled that her child has gone to the zoo and says, so what did you see at the zoo? And all, on every page, the grandma is um, doing a kind of dance, you know, and trying to enact and get a reaction out of the child. So did you see the monkeys, she says? Did you see the giraffes? Did you see the elephants? And at the end, the child says, um, it's next week. We haven't been yet, you know? And so there's this, <laughs> wonder, there's this wonderful kind of story twist and those sorts of twists are exactly what storytellers have been doing for thousands of years. Right. And, and that's magical. Uh, 
apparently there is someone raising a hand, but I cannot see them. I can't. Uh, I think uh, it has been really wonderful discussing all these things with you. There are quite a few questions even now, but uh, this will go on because it is absolutely stunning the kind of responses that we are getting from participants. And it's all down to you speakers that you have caused people to think so much about something that generally is not treated with the kind of seriousness that it deserves. Children's literature is not child's play, actually. And so thank you so oh. much. Can, can I say, I think, can I I say think, one thing? Um, yes, I wanted to address a question that was raised where um, one of the participants said, why isn't more research on children's literature being done in India? Why isn't it in universities? Well, if you went back a generation in Australia, exactly the same thing happened. Um, people, I, I, can I can remember a lecturer in Austin Literature saying to me, so do you do real assignments in children's literature? And I said, no, we just play in the sandbox. <laughs> no, it's just like, it's so annoying, that kind of attitude. And what does it come from? It's totally sexist. It's imperialist so and it's sexist. That is to say, in my society, and I think maybe in yours, we've mostly given the raising of young children to women. And if women are regarded as subordinate in power in the society, we've seen anything that interests them, such as children and children's stories, as of secondary importance. And I'm afraid that that's what I grew up with as a university student, that the idea of choosing to do research or teaching in children's literature made me third rate. I have another binary there to only add to what Mark has said. Anything which gives you joy and which <laughs> <laughs> is regarded as frivolous. Yeah. Yes. As university props, you're supposed to be serious. I could never be that. So perhaps I wasn't authentic. Yeah. But that is, again, a stereotype that anything which gives you joy is not really to be considered uh, as relevant for university study. But I would urge young people who are looking for good thesis topics, MA, MPhil, PhD, to please work in this area. It is rich, it is vast, it is rewarding, and most importantly, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. I, I, I think I, if I don't stop thanking you now, I'm going to finish saying whatever the is planned. So, <laughs> I think, uh, I think Deepthi now, you should take over. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, all of you. Uh, this was a wonderful uh, discussion that we had. And even on the YouTube, we are getting live comments saying, you know, this is something that we have never experienced. And it was a wonderful experience for all of them for attending uh, this session. Uh, thank you, Gautami, for moderating this session and taking as many questions as uh, we could during uh, considering the time uh, that we have. Uh, can I uh, now move ahead from this and present my vote of thanks? Uh, we need also to take a few feedbacks uh, from the participants. So I'm just unmuting, uh, I mean, I'm muting all of you now. Uh, and we are now inviting feedback from the participants. Gautami? Hello, yes. Could you please turn off the videos and the... Uh, Microphones, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Alison Dury in "Don't Tell the Grown Ups: The Subversive Power of Children's Literature." mention how the great subversive works of children's literature suggest that there are other ways of looking at human life besides those of shopping malls and corporation. They mock current assumptions and express the imaginative, unconventional, non-commercial view of the world in its simplest and purest form. 
they appeal to the imaginative questioning and rebellious child within all of us renew our instinctive energy and act as a force of change this is why such literature is worthy of our attention and will long endure after more conventional tales have been forgotten well the most beautiful moments almost seem to accelerate and slip beyond one's grasp just when you want to hold on to them for as long as possible similarly the past 3 hours that we have uh, spent together enjoying the academic deliberations have come to an end although we could go on enjoying this feast for thought arranging this webinar was a huge learning experience for all of us as organizers we would love to have your feedback that will help us in the long run and i'm very happy to say that we have participants literally from four corners of the country right from jammu kashmir to kanyakumari from assam mizoram uh, to gujarat so all four corners covered plus we also have participants from canada from uh, uae from the states and uh, from morocco as well joining us here uh, we have dr pathik roy uh, from darjeeling assam uh, pathik sir if you are here could you please uh, switch on your video dr pathik roy uh, hello yes uh, it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it okay, so i suppose we'll start we'll start <laughs> hello yes yes so you are visible you are visible oh, i am visible i see and audible yes 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 okay yeah so uh, thank you uh, professor dipti uh, indeed um, oh uh, roy sir uh, you need to unmute yourself please Yes, am I audible now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Professor Dipti. Uh, first and foremost, I must congratulate the organizers for having put together this amazing web conference. Uh, you know, the last couple of hours have been an enlightening experience. More so because children's literature has become so pertinent these days. You know, it's very relevant uh, with the lockdown and everything. You know, we are spending more time with the children. and uh, you know the chill, uh, and and you know storytelling has become at least for some of us it, it has become one way of reaching out uh, to the children perhaps you know very practical way of keeping them busy but at the same time this is also a way by which we try to pass on certain messages you know and with the rise of say this violence with the rise of separatism as dr kumi has so rightly pointed out it is very important that we inculcate the right values amongst the coming generation and i think dr kumi's narrative recreation technique which she talks about you know where she talks about changing the story to change the world uh, that is a very interesting and motivating concept for us uh, who are teachers and who are parents and who are caregivers who are raising up children uh, indeed all the three resource persons were absolutely amazing Uh, and the, the last conversation between Professor Mark uh, McLeod and uh, Sangeeta Bansali, ma'am, brought in issues of actual dissemination and reception of the physical book. You know, and therefore the idea that the aim is not to sell a book but to raise a reader, I think that was something that really caught on. You know, the idea that uh, difficult topics can be and should be mediated and adumbrated through books. you know that is also very important for us uh, who are parents of uh, you know small children so this all of this was extremely enlightening and thought provoking and there was a lot to take away from this field of ideas which was generated and interestingly was interspersed with you know stories as uh, dr gautami rightly said children's literature is not child's play and finally hats off to the impeccable organization skills which made this happen practically without a single technical hitch i think uh, a big hand to all the organizers not a single technical hitch and it was done extremely well you know seamlessly done i must say and uh, and even you know when it uh, for the days that were leading up to this program i think they were most helpful and most forthcoming forthcoming with all the queries that the participants had all in all it was a worthwhile experience and i think i spent 3 hours you know very well thank you very much for this
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patik Roy, for your kind feedback. Uh, we also have here Dr. Michelle Phillip from Wilson College. Uh, Michelle, ma'am, would you please unmute yourself? Yes, Michelle, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and of course, Dr. Vavaina is no stranger to uh, the area of children's literature. She's always been uh, such an inspiration to all of us who've taken an interest in children's literature. And uh, I think our uh, conferences, international level conferences and storytellers that have come in from all over the world I think our testimony to the work that uh, Dr. Vavaina has been doing in the area of children's literature. Uh, besides this, uh, Dr. Mark and Sangeeta and the work that they are both doing in uh, ensuring that the habit of reading is... Uh, uh, hello, even if, they, if it's not a physical book, uh, children are uh, reading and uh, uh, being engaged and drawn into the exciting fantasy world of uh, children's fiction. And as usual, fiction for children is unfortunately written by adults and the choices that adults continue to make for children is a dilemma that we as parents will always face. Thank you very much to the organizers for making such a, um, you know, an enlightening session possible, for inviting all of us to be a part of it and for bringing together speakers uh, whose passion for the subject is going to see it carry forward and make it a topic that will be, um, you know, disseminated more in uh, literature syllabi in the future. Thank you so much and congratulations to the organizing team. It was very well organized and seamlessly done with the least of Deepthi and your team and to the speakers. Thank you so much for your enlightening talks on the topic of children's literature. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, we also have Dr. Hemangi Bhagwat, ma'am, here. Dr. Hemangi Bhagwat, ma'am. Okay. Um, thank you all. This means a lot to us. It's time for me now to present the vote of thanks. And there are lots of people I need to thank here. First of all, thank you, Vimana ma'am, Pumi ma'am, who has been our teacher uh, at postgraduate level. Thank you, Dr. Mark McLeod, McLeod sorry, and Mrs. Sangeeta Bansali for not just accepting the invitation to be a part of our webinar, but also being involved in the entire planning of the sessions right up to the minutest details. It was a humbling experience working with all of you. Thank you so much. I thank Shri Kisho Rangnekar, President of Chikitsa Samuha, for being with us this morning to bless us. I also thank all management members for providing us an opportunity to organize this webinar. I thank our CEO, Dr. Malakavata, for being with us. I special thanks to Principal Dr. Shri Kansavan, who not only guided us, but was also involved in each and every step of planning and execution of the webinar. Thank you also to our vice principals, Dr. Arti Savan, Dr. Ramesh Yamgar, and Shri Andy Kumar. I wish to place on record our thanks to Professor Deepak Chinde from SB College Shahpur, who allowed us to use this Zoom to avoid the last minute technical glitches. So, if everything went on smoothly, you have Professor Deepak Chinde to thank for it as well. I thank my colleague, my best friend. My support system, Dr. Gautam for managing all the technical aspects. We 
without her involvement in the right from the conception to the execution, the webinar would have been a distant dream. Thank you, Gopi. Thank you, Mushtaq, our former student and now an assistant professor, for introducing us to Dr. Mutab and for carrying out the initial communication Thank you, Yashushri, again, our former student and now our colleague, for executing all the webinar related to us effectively. I cannot but thank our former students who stood by us in this event, as always. Thank you, Ms. Gopi and Sashwini Pandit, for being our eyes and ears on YouTube and communicating with us. And last but not least, I can thank you for being an interest of the webinar and being a part of our memorable experience. Thank you all. Now, a few instructions before about the feedback and the e-certificate. The link for the feedback is in the chat box. It will also be shared on YouTube chat box, WhatsApp, and Telegram groups. And the link will remain active for 24 hours and is still tomorrow noon. Please be careful your name and the name of your institution as they will appear on the e-certificate. Since the certificates are auto-generated, no changes can be made later. You will receive the certificates within five days. Do not leave the WhatsApp or Telegram group till you have received your certificates. So thank you once again, all of you. Stay home, stay safe, and have a great day.